Good morning. Good morning, everyone watching at home. We have here a fascinating passage of Scripture. It offers both a picture and a plan for effective missions. Acts 19 can be understood as being both descriptive and prescriptive. So as Luke narrates, he's painting a picture with words of what occurred on their third mission trip uh, somewhere around A.D. 52. He's describing the events that took place during this pivotal time in the early church. And while the primary intent is descriptive, there are also prescriptive principles that we can draw out and apply to mission today. Luke is recording history, but he's also teaching valuable lessons, timeless principles of effective missions and ministry, of the transformative work of the Holy Spirit that are relevant and incredibly timely because they work. This stuff really works. He says twice in the text, uh, applying these principles in the city region uh, to reach everyone for the gospel. Look what he says in verse 10 and 20. He says, all the people heard the word of the Lord. That would be the mission. And then verse 20, in this way, by these principles, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Ephesus was a port city on the western coast of modern Turkey, the jewel of Asia Minor, a bustling city renowned for its grand culture and architecture and vibrant uh, trade. It was home to the Temple of Artemis, which was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, and so it drew both uh, pilgrims uh, as well as visitors to that great city. It was also a bastion of paganism and sorcery and worldliness. Could an unreached, unchurched city region like that be evangelized with the gospel? Now, there were barriers to the good news of Jesus in that ancient city that are no more or no less right here in Portland. But those barriers are nothing to our God. Amen? Paul was led by the Holy Spirit to labor there for over two years. And while there, he wrote to the church in Corinth. He wrote this, 1 Corinthians 16, 9. He says, a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many of those who oppose me. With God as the architect of destiny, no force can hinder the blueprint of his divine will. Besides Antioch, which was their home base, Paul and his team were, were on the ground in Ephesus more than they were in any other city on their mission trips. That investment, that commitment, and their reliance on the Holy Spirit to lead them all preceded massive wave of conversions to Christianity. A washing away of idol worship and a rising tide of good social change. The, the Holy Spirit's power here is nothing short than a Gentile Pentecost, which is the title of today's message. My friends, we, we have here the New Testament strategic plan to reach a city with the gospel. It's ab absolutely critical that we know it and that we do it. So as we walk through the text, keep in mind both the historical context that's described and the pertinent implications that can be applied in our mission here at Village. Let's begin with verse 1. Paul arrives at the outskirts of the city, and there he finds 12 men described as disciples, which is a great start to the mission, right? Paul's mission was go and make disciples. Here he shows up on the outskirts of the city, and he's already got a dozen, right? But then he asks a question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. In other words, they had only heard the good news. 
they haven't yet experienced the fullness of new life that flows from the good news. That there was a gap in their understanding of the full gospel. John the Baptist was a forerunner to Jesus, his cousin. He offered a baptism of repentance to prepare the people for the coming Messiah. But, but those who only knew John's baptism had yet not yet taken part in the full revelation of Christ Jesus and his spirit. So John's baptism, a preparation for what was to come, which was a baptism of participation, to participate in Christ through baptism. What we're going to do next Sunday, we're going to have baptisms right here. It, it means to publicly affirm one's faith and symbolically unite with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And that signifies the believer's new life in Christ. Participation. Now apparently this, this gap in understanding was not uncommon. Notice the first question that he asks. Paul asked them this question, why? Because it's a reference here. Notice at the beginning of verse 1, it mentions Apollos in verse 1. In chapter 18, the previous chapter, we meet Apollos. He's, he's a knowledgeable Egyptian-born pastor. And he only knew John's baptism until this wonderful, amazing couple, Aquila and Priscilla, explained the way of God more accurately to him. And then Luke writes that he was filled with the Holy Spirit to great effect in understanding the gospel, experiencing new life completely. It's not just about knowing things about God. It's about being known by God and knowing God personally. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. They'd been prepared for what was to come by focusing on repentance, by recognizing their need for God. Being filled with the Holy Spirit means experiencing a profound resurrection presence and empowerment of God. Guiding, transforming a person's life. So what was required was their participation. So next Sunday, as our pastor is baptized, they will say, buried with Christ in his baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. A deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit is needed to guide, strengthen, and transform you too. Enabling you to live a more purposeful and impactful Christian life. Receiving the Holy Spirit, my friends, is required of true disciples. It says, when Paul placed his hands on them and prayed, the Holy Spirit came on them and right there they experienced a mini Pentecost. They began to speak fluently in different languages. They prophesied. They praised God for what God had done and for what God was going to do in the future. And when they received the Holy Spirit, they didn't just receive new belief, they were emboldened to live out a new life, a new faith in such a way that was going to shake the city of Ephesus. So number one, if you're taking notes, number one strategic plan to reach a city with the gospel is this. God's servants are radicalized. They're radicalized. Now obviously that word has a negative connotation. Politically, uh, in religious terms, especially with regard to the, the clash of civilizations that we're experiencing in the world today. But what other word than radical can I come up with when I look at Jesus' own words? He calls his followers to radical commitment, to radical love, revolutionary service, extreme sacrifice, fanatical selflessness. These and more are fundamental to the nature of authentic Christianity. Genuine conversion, it often leads to profound internal transformation and not just behavioral changes, to real transformation inside. 
in order to reach our region with the gospel, we need to see people convert, discipled, and equipped, and sent out as spirit-filled radicals. People with values and desires to live changed lives. Give me 12 radical disciples for Christ and we'll reach all of Oregon. Have you, my friend, experienced repentance and preparation? Or have you also stepped into your, your new identity, empowered participants in the kingdom of God? Have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? I want to encourage you, beloved, this can be your experience. And this is how you'll know. This is what it's seen. It's seen in the consistency of new Christ-like character over time. And what then motivates you shifts from self-centeredness to serving others, to loving God and loving other people. It shifts in an awareness of a deepening sense of Christ's resurrection presence that forms new purposes. It's beyond a, a momentary mountaintop experience. It's seen over the long haul. Number one, God's servants are radicalized. Number two, God's word is proclaimed. We're in verses uh, 8 to 10 if you're following along. Paul uh, followed his tried and true pattern. Whenever he went into a city, where would he start? He'd start in the synagogue, the Jewish house of worship. And verse 8 says, uh, sp he, he spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Preaching the gospel is essential because it conveys the transformative power of God's salvation, which, which can't be fully understood through good deeds alone. While acts of kindness reflect Christ's love, it's the message of God's word that offers hope and eternal life and guides people into relationship with their creator. Gospel mission without preaching. People may miss the vital understanding of salvation and the hope found in Jesus. And that reduces the message to mere moralism, not spiritual transformation. And so, so Paul preached boldly about our blood-bought salvation. He preached the cross. And how did it go? How did it go over? Not so great. Luke writes, some became obstinate, stubbornly refusing to change their minds. And worse than that, it says they, they maligned the way. Some hardened their hearts, and, and maligned the way means they spoke ill of Christians and the Christian faith, they rejected both the message and the messengers. Now, despite this opposition, the word continued to spread and gain influence throughout the region. I will say, even the best communicator, the most gifted preacher, can't change a hardened heart. Well, only God can do that. So Paul did what... Uh, what he always did when the word was rejected. He moved on. If they resist the word of God, proclaimed honestly, clearly, persuasively for three months or three years, it may be time to move on. And that's what he did. But where did Paul go next to proclaim God's word? Notice what he did, something novel. He didn't leave the city Instead, he did the most unusual thing by renting a public hall. L look again with me at verse 9b. When we say A or B, it usually means the second half of a verse. So there's part A would be the first part of the sentence. This is verse 9b. It says, so Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This served as a gathering place for discussion, dialogue, and debate in the city of Ephesus. And it allowed Paul to engage both locals and visitors. Scholars have found historical records that, that 
a report that in, during the midday siesta when, when people would have a break from work and they'd go home and have a light meal or, or take a nap or spend time with family and friends, they also would come to this hall to listen to midday lectures. This venue became a most significant center for spreading the Christian message in Ephesus and the surrounding region. So let's imagine for a moment that our whole congregation right now is strategically planning how to reach a city and a region with the gospel. And you have two options. Option A, three months speaking once a week to religious people. And we're going to vote. Option A, uh, speaking for three months once a week to a bunch of religious people. Option B, five hours a day, uh, five hours a day, six days a week, 52 weeks a year for two years of teaching and preaching and dialoguing with non-believers in the heart of the city. That's 3,120 hours proclaiming the word of God. What an investment. Now, years later, when the church in Ephesus is well uh, established and grown, grown to be quite a major church, Paul will write a letter called the letter to the Ephesians. And at the end of that letter, a church that was vast and huge, he writes this in Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. He asks for prayer. He says, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may desire, declare it fearlessly as I should. That, that humbles me and inspires me. Lord God, may, may we pastors fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Help us use any means necessary at, at any cost. Paul was in chains when he wrote that. This text suggests that the church can thrive outside traditional settings. It also emphasizes the importance of adaptability in our mission efforts. What possible new methods of reaching out and learning that can foster deeper connections among people in an increasingly secular world may the Holy Spirit be leading us to employ and engage our community? The potential for transformation exists wherever the gospel is authentically lived out and accurately proclaimed. Number one, Jesus' followers are radicalized. God's word is proclaimed. And number three, God's power is demonstrated. Look at verses 11 uh, and on, 11 to 16. I'll read verses uh, 11 and 12. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were, were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. In the bustling heart of the city, God's unleashed extraordinary miracles through his faithful servant Paul. That handkerchiefs and aprons, mere fabric, became channels of divine power, healing the sick, casting out evil spirits. With a single touch. Just imagine the awe as people rush to witness these miracles. Their lives transformed all in the name of Jesus. I went to, to Jerusalem in 2014. There you'll see the stone of unction. It's a large slab of stone inside the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. By local tradition, on this rock, Jesus' body was laid and prepared for burial. Pilgrims will sprinkle the stone with oil and wash it off with cloth. And by popular belief, from now on, that fabric is soaked with the sanctity of the stone. Some will even place their infants on the stone to receive a blessing. I witnessed very sincere, genuine believers there, touching the stone. I witness 
people with a box of scarves and an empty box quickly rubbing and putting it in the next box to be taken, distributed, maybe sold. Now notice, Paul was not selling anything. He was no con artist, no. This was pure, unadulterated demonstration of the Spirit's power. It wasn't Paul, it wasn't the fabric that had the power. It was the Spirit power being demonstrated. God's resurrection presence, it's active today, though it may not always manifest in miraculous ways. And I've never have, have witnessed the miracles that we see here in Acts 19. Yeah, I see his power transforming lives, answering prayers, the way he provides supernatural comfort and healing in everyday circumstances, the power of a congregation praying in unison. While we may not witness the same dramatic miracles, trust that God is still working wonderful miracles. Amen? Amen. Now, now notice the contrast between authentic spiritual authority and counterfeit practices. While Paul's ministering was rooted in a deep relationship with Jesus and he's empowered by his spirit, see what happens when others attempt to wield spiritual authority without a true connection with God. So long come the seven sons of Sceva. Sounds like a heavy metal band, doesn't it? Now, seven sons of Sceva. Back then, your name really meant something. And these seven men, men child, were the son of the high priest. And they traveled around making money by supposedly performing exorcisms. Now, now I should say, it's anyone's guess whether they were just con artists pretending to do something or if they were dabbling in, in dark magic arts of the devil. But they were looking for an edge on the competition. And they had heard of the success of this Paul. And they probably measured success by how much money they could make and how many followers they had. So these dimwits say, let's give it a try. So they start going around saying, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. The ensuing chaos reveals the authority of Jesus is appointed to only qualified individuals and the futility of trying to harness his power for personal gain. Look what happens in verse 15. The, the man who's possessed by an evil spirit, it says he, he, uh, he responds to them when they're trying to cast him out. He says, Jesus I know, Paul I know about, but who are you? And then the man possessed by this Spirit is somehow given incredible strength and he overpowers all, all seven of them and beats them and they go running out of the house bloodied and naked. Which is a little humorous, but it's also quite a warning. The point is, they were trying to exercise an external life in God, but they didn't have the inner life that corresponded with it. And the results were disastrous. Ministers who have no inner life with God should not be engaged in external ministry. Yet that's sadly what happens so much nowadays and for so often. Think of what would have happened in this church 5, 10, 30 years on if the sons of Sceva had become pastors or, or elders or directors in that church. No, God was going to put a stop to it right there in Acts 19. What a mess they would have been in if these seven had become leaders. The sons of Sceva represent those who engage in religious activities without the inner transformation that comes from knowing Christ personally. Their failure serves as a stark warning. Genuine faith can't be manufactured or borrowed. In one of my churches back east, we were interviewing candidates for the director of worship. We had a, a, a big choir at that church and a, and a big praise team. And so we had a lot of applicants that came in. And the search team narrowed the list down to their, their, their most experienced, most highly skilled 
educated music director. And I remember their top candidate, uh, who had a huge choir and orchestra, uh, came to my office for the final interview. And after some pleasantries, I just had one question. Tell me about your faith in Jesus. Tell me, tell me your, your testimony. You know what the maestro said to me, his answer? Something like, well, uh, religion has always played a part in my life. I enjoy very much working in the church. I feel comfortable working here. I tried, I was trying to throw the brother a, a bow. I got come on. He could not articulate a life of walking with the Lord. And he did not get that job. <laughs> because it's more than a job. Ministry is a lifestyle. A genuine Christian pastor must be grounded in Scripture, care deeply for their congregation, exemplify humility and integrity in their service. And we must rely on the power of Jesus in our lives and not try to operate in our own strength. Amen? Amen. Please pray for us pastors. When we embody authentic faith, then God's power is demonstrated, not only transforming us as those that have the privilege to serve, but transforming a congregation. Number one, Jesus' followers are regularized. Number two, the word of God is proclaimed. Number three, God's power is demonstrated. And four and final point, God's people are transformed. Notice what happened after this incident with a severe beating. We're looking at verses 17 to 20. When news spread of the incident, it says uh, throughout Ephesus, it says that all of the Ephesians, Jews and Greeks alike, it says this, verse 17, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord was held in high regard. That's not exactly what we're looking for as a mission report when we come back on missions, right? How did it go on your mission trip? Everyone was seared with fear. <laughs> Seized with fear, I should say. And panic. No, no, in fact, if you keep reading, this movement will lead to riots in the streets of Ephesus. We see here the profound impact of God's power as both fear and reverence spread among the people witnessing the miracles through Paul and the fallout of the false prophets, positive and negative. This passage serves as, as both a powerful reminder of God's authority and a warning against taking his holiness lightly. Approach him, my friends, with awe and respect in your lives. Now look what happened next. It says the people started confessing their sins and divulging their, their wicked practices. Look at verse 18. Which people, which people were confessing and doing these things? It's believers. This is remarkable. People who claim to be believers, followers of Jesus are in view here. And notice and underline if you have your own text, many of those who believed now, underline now, came and openly confessed their sins and renounced their practices. This situation hit the believers there. Listen, village, for all of us here listening, all of us watching it online, no matter how long you've gone to church, you still need to repent and ask God to examine your life. And every revival has started in the church. These people had heard the message of Paul. They had confessed faith, but they were still secretly practicing witchcraft. And it says that they brought all that junk together and burned it in public. And I love that the Apostle Paul says the value of those items to really make it grounded. In today's dollars, it would be about $7 million worth of junk. Not resold, not stashed away, burned publicly. God's people were transformed. These baby Christians in Ephesus responded, and it symbolized a radical break from their past. 
There was no turning back. This act of repentance and devotion marked a profound turning point in the book of Acts. This is the moment when the spread of the gospel reached a new level of influence in a major Gentile cultural and religious center. What what makes it unique is the dramatic shift it represents. Not, Not only is the word of the Lord spreading, but it's so undeniable it leads to significant change and confrontations with entrenched pagan practices, setting the stage for the church's expansion and growth. Notice the gospel's impact in the people's lives transformed, extended beyond their conversion. It wasn't just about me and God. It changed the whole community. It challenged social norms and values. When people genuinely encounter Jesus, it it can lead to collective repentance. Shifts in community practices were seen here in Ephesus. Friends, this is what revival looks like. Historically, revivals have always started in the church. The first and second uh, Great Awakening, the Korean and Welsh revivals around the turn of the century, the Azusa Street revival in Los Angeles, the Argentina Argentina, uh, revival in the 1970s, just to name a few. I'm talking about transformation not merely of personal morality, but a deep engagement with the cultural fabric of the city. Now, right now, is to time to pray that God would demonstrate his power here, here and now. Let's pray for transformation right here and now, that all who hear my voice, someone here in this room, in this sacred space, right now will pray, I pray that you decide right now to leave behind that bad habit. Delete that bad influence that you know is harmful or is contrary to being a follower of Jesus. Whatever it is in Jesus' name, an addiction, a toxic relationship, unethical business practices, Cheating on your homework. You once thought it was harmless, but now you know and you see how destructive it is. Leave it now in Jesus' name. As we conclude, let me ask a series of questions, a few questions for you to consider during our reflection time, and we'll close with this. Are you ready to experience our own Pentecost here and now? Surrendering our past to embrace the new life God offers. Just as the 12 needed to to move past John's baptism to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we are called to deeper waters of relationship with Jesus and to use our spiritual gifts for good. So my next question, do you desire to be a channel for his transformative power? Where has God placed you Monday through Friday? Why why there? Why do you work there? Why are you there all week? For what purpose? At work, at home, wherever it may be, why has God placed you there? Are you using your position for his mission or will you waste it? Will you waste the opportunity? Look to see what he's already doing and ask, how how can I help? The last question for today is this. Are you willing to let go and ask the Holy Spirit to transform yourself and those around you and all of us? Village Church, let's continue to foster a church culture where everyone feels valued, regardless of their background. Let's continue to create new innovative opportunities for service and missions. And let's pray, pray, pray for the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do in our church. And at the end of the day, how will we know that our efforts are any good? How will we know? 
if all of our investment in mission was worth it. Look again in verse 20. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. This is what real power looks like in the book of Acts. This is the power of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Power to rescue, power to bind, and power to free. Power to heal, power to restore, power to redeem, and power to reach. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Amen.